So, Michael, welcome to Copenhagen. Welcome to a place that is nowhere and everywhere. Yes. Um, for all of us, I think when I read that you were coming to direct this, you are so closely associated with many of Michael Frayn's plays. You were the first director of Copenhagen. You then took it into the West End after 300 performances at the National. Then he was in Broadway, all of these things. What is it like to return to such an important and big play that you already premiered these sort of 30 years on? Well, for this play, which I think is a great play, it was an enormous pleasure to return to it because it's some 20 years since I did it originally. And I'd sort of forgotten it. I remembered the essence of it, but I'd forgotten it. Uh, and to return to it with the knowledge of having done it four times, because I did it in London, at the National, then in London, then in New York, then in Paris, then in Australia. So, but I, in the intervening time, I'd forgotten it. And to return to it with, as it were, so much prior understanding of the play there, so much work done, and the cast, who I think are absolutely sensationally good, and I hope you agree when you see them, uh, they were willing, and only good actors can do this, to let me give them what I already knew about the play. So, it, it, uh, and they were open, and I would even, to ways of saying a line or something, only a very good actor can you do that with. And they said no, they wanted to take it on, so I told them everything I knew about the play which meant that after about 10 days, we were at, <laughs> at the point where I'd previously been in week four. And so we could then refine it and refine it, and they, they made their contribution and built on what was already there. We're doing it in much the same way, uh, with some of the additional things that modern theatre allows a director to do. I won't tell you about them because they're surprises. But uh, they, they are great, though. <laughs> <laughs> One of them in particular is great, and I'm hoping a few people faint. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 I'm doing it much the same way, which is with three chairs, only the, these three chairs and a lighted space. Because the amazing thing about this play, and it's, it, uh, there's, a, there's a line in, in the play where uh, Bohr says to his wife, Margaret, you, you make everything so personal. And she says, but everything is personal. Mm -hmm. And this play came out of Michael Friend's talent with a very particular, from a very particular personal point of view. Uh, he was, uh, uh, as a young man, he did his national service. And he was one of those bright kids who were given the choice of learning Russian instead of learning to march about with a rifle. I suppose with a view to creating people who could work in espionage or, or something like that in the event of war. So he learned Russian and he, he shared a, a tent with another young man his own age, they were in their late teens I suppose, uh, whose passion was the physics that Bohr and Heisenberg did in the 20s. And Michael himself got terribly interested in it. And he was very young and bright and he absorbed the whole thing. And then he forgot about it. And then he went to Cambridge and he studied philosophy. And the, 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 the play is a result of the mel melding of these two rather uncomfortable disciplines that don't sit well together, namely science and philosophy. And he has sort of learnt the science, presents the science, and then moves out of the science into its philosophical implications. And the reason he found Bohr such a sympathetic character is because he was one of the very few scientists who always said, but what does it mean? <coughs> what are the philosophical implications of the work we're doing? And if all of them possibly had thought a little stronger about that, they might not have been so readily uh, willing to build a bomb because it was built in a good cause, but once this thing is launched, heaven knows what's going to come round the corner in the next historical event. And when you were first working on it, um, and it was fresh and it was a new play and all of those things, when you come back to a play, that I know you've directed it in, you know, all over the world and you're coming back to it now 20 years on, 
Do you hear or see different things in it with the context of your eyes now, as it were, that you didn't think back in 1998? Or actually, is it such a strong play that the play is bigger than the context, almost? I think it is, I, I think it is such a strong, uh, strong play. I mean, I still think exactly what I thought before, but, this, but a little bit further on. You know, but I, didn't, I certainly didn't come back and say, oh, that was all wrong, or I, 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 it's the same, the same piece of work. Mm. Yeah. So one of the questions that we as the audience are asked, to start with, we have to accept we are nowhere and everywhere. You know, we're not in a drawing room in Copenhagen. We are somewhere. Yes, so. that's right. Um, and then the play asks questions about observation, about the nature of memory, about the idea of who owns a story, about how truth works and doesn't work. When you go into the rehearsal room with a play like this that is so full of extraordinary ideas, do you simply, this is a naive question really, but do you simply start at the beginning of the text and work it through, or do you talk about ideas before you start to actually block each scene? Well, a little bit of talk. Um, a lot of directors are, f are famous, or perhaps I should say infamous, for opening statements that go on for about three days. <laughs> but I, I don't really believe in that. I think you've got to do it. It's rather like the science in the play, you know. You've got to do it to learn what's there. Uh, that means there's, there's plenty of room for talk. Uh, I, well, I, I knew nothing about the science, and I read the play... And I didn't understand it, but I found it absolutely mesmerising. And what's become very apparent doing it again is that there is so much drama in these situations and so much human behaviour and the fallibility of the characters, and the, in, in spite of their brilliance, their weaknesses and their strengths and the interplay between them emotionally. Emotionally, it's a very strong play. Mm. When I first read it, I didn't understand a word, but I found it... <laughs> absolutely gripping and then I would read it again and I found I'd start reading it and it's got a drive to it which is mesmeric and when Michael and I first talked about the play we kind of thought well I, I admired it but I thought I don't know that the general public are going to really like it and we thought uh, it would probably appeal to a, a, minor, a minority audience of people who are like Michael interested in the subject. But the minute we got it in front of a public, we, the public, even a small audience of the Cottesloe, we realised it was a play for everybody. Mm. Because what happens in the play, within 10 minutes, they begin to realise that it's about two very important things. First of all, it's about the possible annihilation of the, war, of the world mm. through atomic weapons. But also that, that, that physics in the 20s absolutely altered the way we comprehend reality and that they will leave the theatre thinking about life and thinking about what they're seeing in a completely different way. So it was about two things that are very important to everybody and audiences suddenly attend because I think they gather that this is, they need to listen closely because they might learn something. And you don't have to understand all of the physics no, not in order, at all. no, not be, at all. because often the the two scientists turn to Margaret and say, "No, we need to talk in plain language." You know, so she, so she's us, isn't That's she? Right. In a way, and also a lot of, like a lot of Einstein stuff, a lot of the propositions in the play uh, had never been discovered because they're so completely obvious. I mean, the, one of the principal ideas that I think begins with Einstein is the idea of measurement that, uh, as Newton posited it, measurement was a sort of absolute, apart from humankind, which, which applied universe, universally and would apply forever. And Einstein simply observed that the only people who can make measurements are human beings. Mm. And if you make a measurement, you are unconsciously altering the thing you measure. So you can never actually observe what you're trying to measure, or indeed measure properly, because in measuring, you're slightly altering it. And this is such a simple idea, but it's obviously a true one. 
And one of the ideas in the play that struck me enormously was the sense that you could never be in the present. You could never actually see yourself as the other people were seeing you and the way that everybody moved around and the, the lovely repeating of back we go to that day in 19, that evening in 1941, right. the crunch on the gravel. And it's so mesmerising because in the interval here, everybody was talking about physics. Yes, Normally right. people are saying, do you want strawberry or coffee? Yes, Ice right. cream. But it, it, I mean, it kind of takes over people. People want to start I to be able to understand I think that is true. It. That is the remarkable mm. thing about it. And in order to accommodate the subject, because Michael Fran's premise was that everybody in the play is now dead and they're inhabiting a kind of limbo. And they're, they're, but they're still obsessed with this question. And the question is a very important one, because if Heisenberg had got what he wanted when he came to visit the Boers during the war in 1941, he might have gone back to Germany with a way of making a German atomic bomb. So this particular event is crucial because he didn't get what he wanted and Bohr reacted differently to the way he hoped he would and he went back to Germany relatively empty-handed. If he had gone back with the knowledge that possibly he was after, there would have been a German bomb and we would now live in a different world. Mm. And that, that is why the visit that is endlessly discussed is so important. There is, I mean, I'm not in the pay of the theatre recommending you buy a programme, but you really should buy the programme. Um, there's a very interesting piece by Michael Frayn in the programme about evidence in a particular letter that has come to light that was released by Boer's estate. Um, and he talks about whether he considered rewriting some of it. Did you have those conversations with him? And, and what do you think about the idea of updating plays because the historical record comes in with a slightly different... Well, I think we both of us agreed, finally, that he should leave the play much as it was. He made a few small alterations, but the premise of the play is fictional. I mean, there is no, there's no limbo where the dead, or maybe there is, but I, I, I haven't discovered it yet, where the dead have a sort of another life to, ha to argue these problems. And... Uh, the, 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 there's, there were already certain dramatic contractions, like when uh, Heisenberg visited the Boers, he visited them apparently three or four times in that one week, and Michael has compressed those three visits into one. And so the, there was already a dramatic license, and the play was making all the points it needed to make very aptly. So I thought it was <coughs> idle to uh, let the scientific pedants alter the work of art. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing play because uh, in order to tell his subject, he's been forced to jump about in time. And uh, that's why we finally finished with just these three chairs, so that the audience were never stuck with an, with, mm. with an image that they had to then imagine another setting. And the play moves back and forth. It, sometimes the characters are in their limbo existence. Other times they're acting out what happened in that famous meeting. Sometimes one of the characters will be outside looking at the other people, acting it out and commenting on it. And so the way he's been forced to and has brilliantly managed to juggle with time, both the present, the past, and even the future sometimes, uh, is quite extraordinary and comes out of the demands the material put on it. And is that where um, the simplicity of the staging, but the use of light and sound becomes so important? Because that kind of, you know, hits us there in a way, doesn't yes, it? Some, some of those absolutely. moments, they're very moving. Very moving. And sound is very important. I mean, if you watch, I watch CNN a lot at the moment, the American station, uh, because I'm obsessed with Trump. <laughs> And I think the end game is approaching, so I, I want to get the, I want to watch. It's as melodrama, it's thrilling, whatever its consequences. For, but actually, Trump makes this play eight times more relevant than when we did it. I mean, when we did it, the Cold War was over, and it looked as if there were going to be no threat, of possibilities of nuclear bombs going off. Suddenly, alas, that, that possibility has come back, so the play has suddenly leapt into the... Yes, into and the, the consequences of scientific discovery yes. being taken away from morality or ethics. It, yes, yes, exactly. Yes. It's, it's very much more relevant. 
But if I, if I, if I, when I watch CNN, there are these ghastly ads that, that happen every so often in between people speaking, and they drive me mad because they're endlessly repeated. But I find if I turn the sound off and look at the picture, it's much less distracting than leaving the sound on and getting rid of the picture. <laughs> sound is much more irritating and it's much more emotionally triggered. And, and we use a lot of sound in the production uh, and it has the effect of taking you back in a way that possibly a picture doesn't, an image doesn't. And, and it's more emotionally charged. Yes, and it feels, uh, you know, in a, in a way, when you're in the audience watching a, a piece of work that is so fine with such extraordinary pr- performances from all three actors, you almost want to intervene and break the silence sometimes or break the sound. Yes, right. Uh, which is obviously what theatre should do, I yes, suppose. Yes, you know, yes. stir us up. Um, as I said at, uh, at the beginning, you have had a long and wonderful uh, partnership with Michael Frayn. You've been the first director of many of his works, you know, not only this, but of course, you know, Benefactors and Democracy and, and Noises Off. Um, what is the difference for you as a director? You know, you've worked all over the world, you've worked with all sorts of people, all the companies, um, between doing a brand new piece of work where the paint's not quite dry and doing a piece of work where the audience already knows it and is already engaged with it. Do you have a different process as a director? No, I think it's exactly the same. You approach the material. It's more fun doing new work because there's that lovely feeling of unveiling something that Mm. wasn't there before. Mm. And if you do something uh, again... But I'm I'm doing this again. I mean, I'm getting as much... I got quite as much pleasure this time as I did last. Mm. Maybe more. And is that because, you said, you, you knew more about it? You're starting several weeks further on than you felt last time? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think Tyrone Guthrie described a director as an ideal audience of one. <laughs> and that, that's, what, that's what you are. I mean, I'm not there to tell them. I, I tell them what I know. And I like to have... I like happy rehearsals mm. with a lot of jokes. Yeah. And uh, I think if you can keep, keep people... Part of the director's job is to keep his cast amused, and uh, uh, and and to, and to be there to receive what they give him, but also to guide them. And in in a case like this, I obviously started with much greater knowledge of the material than they did, so I, I didn't hesitate. I said, "Do you want me to tell you what I know?" And they said, "Sure." So I I gave them all line readings and stuff like that. They didn't mind. But now it's entirely theirs. Mm. And I'm happy. That's my job. I withdraw myself. You, you've worked with many of the great, great writers and actors all over the world. You've obviously one of the associate directors right at the beginning of the National Theatre at the RSC. You've worked in the West End, in Paris, in Australia. You are were Australian. Are, were. I am you Australian. Are. Yes, I it's your accent what Australian. gives it away. Yeah. <laughs> I am Australian. Yeah. So do you still have, though, with everything you've achieved and all the people you've worked with, when you get into that rehearsal room with your new people to play with for the first time, do you still have that sort of flutter oh, of excitement? Oh, oh, well, it's, not a, it's not a flutter of excitement, it's a flutter of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> because you never know. You never know you cast it. You're ultimately dependent on the actors understanding the play you and having the talent to do it. And you never know, because very good actors can be miscast. And you never know whether you're going to be right for the material. There's a a period, like a lot of sort of dogs assembled in a room. The dogs run around and they pee here and they pee there and they, they they sort of have to accommodate the space. And that takes about three days and then suddenly everybody's getting on quite well. And and then hopefully there's a sort of... a communic, whatever the word is, uh, 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 of intention, and, and you start enjoying yourself. I mean, I do it for the fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's wonderful. Are there, are there particular actors that you haven't worked with that you would have liked to or do want to work with? Or is it always the work, the text, that draws it's you? It's always the text originally, yeah. originally. And uh, often, I, I, you know, some of the actors with whom I... Th- I consider that I've failed, have often been very, very good actors 
who, because uh, very, very talented actors often have a very strong idea of what they want. Mm. And sometimes it's very hard to, to, not to tell them what to do, but simply to contribute to what they're trying to do. Mm. And so occasionally you, you, you have experiences that aren't, they're not bad, but they're just not satisfactory. No, and, 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 do you, and you're stuck with that, presumably. Yeah. Once it starts, you know yeah, you that know. there's one dog that should have been left outside in the garden. Oh, maybe, maybe I should have been left outside <laughs> in the garden. <laughs> um, we've only got half an hour this evening, so I'm going to take some questions from the audience earlier than usual. Um, Jeanette has the microphone. Gentleman there to start off. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, I have a question about audience reaction. So I think uh, somebody mentioned that as people went out during the interval, they were talking physics, which I thought was amazing. Um, how do scientists react to the play? Uh, they react rather well. In fact, uh, when we did it in New York, a lot of the physicists that are mentioned in the play, and I, I'm afraid I can't remember which ones, were all my age then. And uh, they, they gave it, they, they were, there was some sort of symposium where they, they were giving an, uh, an address. And Michael Frayn and I went to it, and then we were asked to have a meal afterwards with these guys. And uh, it, they were lovely because they, they relished fun. And some of them were very funny, and they, they talked, and they were just like, uh, I don't know, like a company of actors saying, remember the old days, remember yeah. when we did this, remember when we did that. And it was so strange meeting them, and indeed knowing their responsibility. And uh, I think, I think a, a, an appetite for amusement is very strong in us, and is very we 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 want to find it in our work if we can. And uh, I think uh, politically, if you can engage people in really interest them in their work. Money is important, but it's secondary, and that's why I so deplore the, the, the economics that have come out of the Chicago School, because I think it's making an absolutely monstrous world yeah. in which only money is important. Uh, and I don't think, I don't work for money, and I know a lot of people, you know, yeah. I, I, I want some money, yeah. But, that, but that's different. You need different. some. I need yeah. some, but I don't yeah. work for it. It's no, not, no. not what gives me pleasure. No, and that's not this environment either. No, no. no. And I think this is, most people are like that, mm. I think. They, they want to be, they want something that engages their passions mm. and, uh, and amuses them mm. and makes them, makes them sh have shared feelings with other people. Delphi. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Um, a lo lot of my questions have already been answered now. <laughs> I, ha I ha have one about, um, yes, you've done the play so often, but do you get ever a slightly different slant simply because the cast are new and different? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. The, the, uh, the, thank you. Absolutely, the personality of this cast is very, very different from the first cast I had, and uh, it colours the whole, the whole show. I mean, I think we have, it seems to me, a slightly more emotional performance with this cast than we had before. Uh, it, that doesn't make it better or worse, it just makes it different. But it certainly makes, I think, engages the audience at a slightly more intense level. Uh, the they are very warm on the stage. They feel yes. you feel that the the consequences of them not finding a rapport again are are real to them as well as for the world. Yes, that's right. And, and the the rows they have are very spirited, and the moments of shame and em embarrassment and so forth. Uh, lady in the front, thank you very much. I was at the dress rehearsal, and I did think the two actors the men were amazing. I stopped thinking it was actors and they were physicists. But one thing I did wonder, what was the relevance, it comes up three times, of Niels's um, accident with his boat? Uh, well, it was simply that, uh, you know, no matter how brilliant you are, uh, no matter how successful and clever you are, you're still subject to the appalling shocks that life can bring anyone and that they're waiting there. In your, if you, once you've experienced it, once you've lost a child, 
you know, this becomes your reality and it can take you by surprise. And it was meant really just to, to, to establish the humanity of these remarkable people. They're remarkable, but they're still human. And they're still uh, subject to what we're all subjected to. Broken hearts. Broken hearts. Broken hearts. Yes. Does that, does that answer? Yes. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you a question, Michael, about um, after this play. You, you said in this talk so far that you've come back to this play after a 20-year break. Do you have another? Do you have other plays in, as it were, your directorial back catalogue that you'd like to revisit, and what might they be and why? Well, I, I, I don't really think there is really. I, I, there's one I visited last year at the Southwark Playhouse. There was a musical I did on Broadway with music by Cy Coleman uh, that uh, uh, called the Life, a brilliant score, and it was about a very difficult subject. For an ordinary audience, it was about prostitution in New York in the 70s. But it had a, a, a good book, not quite good enough, but a good book, uh, brilliant lyrics, absolutely brilliant lyrics, and a great score by Cy Coleman. And we did it in New York, and we got all sorts of awards, but we needed a very strong press. And we were up against a show called Titanic, and we needed the Tonys to make us respectable. We got all the other awards. Mm and we missed out on the Tony Awards. Uh, we, went, we, we went, ran for about a year, but I've always wanted to give that, that show another life. And uh, I've been trying to get it off the ground in England, and I managed to get it on at the Southwark Playhouse mm. uh, with very little money, an amazing cast of actors who these days will work for peanuts if they like the, the, the show. And we got it on, it was successful, and I hoped it was going to move. It didn't move, but I'm still working on it. I'd like, I'd like it to happen. Is there a last question? I just wanted to know who was in the original cast. The original cast? Uh, David Burke, uh, uh, Sarah Kestelman, and Matthew Marsh. Yeah. Gentlemen, very no, good. You. They were very good. Very good. Very different, but very good. Yes. Did, did you find at any time with your association with this play that politics came up? Not really, no. Thank you. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> but do, do, what do you mean in terms of politics? I mean, in terms of the outside world intruding on how the characters might be interpreted or their behaviour? Well, well, it was... The whole business of the atomic bomb was so uh, um, intercontinental between uh, particular political regimes that uh, I am surprised that... that well, I, I have to correct that, my, well, my remark, because when we went to America, uh, Heisenberg, uh, as the play shows, although he, he did make a, a terrible mistake in going back to Germany and becoming part of the Nazi establishment, but he didn't... That's all he did. He simply offered... Germany, out of patriotism, not out of any fascist inclinations, he simply offered Germany his loyalty in the event of war. And of course, in New York, uh, there, was a lot, there was a great deal of criticism, and in America, there was a great deal of criticism of this originally, particularly from uh, the Jewish uh, Americans. And some people did feel that the play... I don't think it's true, but I think they thought the play was a little easy on Heisenberg and should have been much stronger in condemning him. Mm. But uh, th that was the only political... And, and uh, a few people disputed the science and uh, aspects of the science, never the whole science. And it led to this string of correspondence that uh, has made Michael Frayn realise that he ha didn't get it exactly right historically. But nothing, nothing other, nothing serious. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I've got to bring it to a close. 
Michael Blakemore, it has been such an honour, all of the things that you've done, not just theatre, but your films, your writing. There are books that you could buy if you would like to know yeah. more. Yes, two, <laughs> two non-fiction and indeed a novel. Not that I want to promote other people's novels, but I really know. But uh, obviously, I, I think it would, they're probably not quite the same. <laughs> um, but ladies and gentlemen, please could you thank Michael Blakemore.